Victor Jonad showed up at the Michigan Lottery Claim Office with 500 winning lottery tickets for the Daily Four Draw, with every ticket having played the numbers 7800. The odds of that many same number tickets winning was incredibly slim. And since Victor had 500 of these tickets, everyone got suspicious. Lottery officials wasted no time in thoroughly examining each ticket, expecting to find some method of cheating. To their surprise, every ticket was genuine. Joe Nadge's confidence and impatience during the process only fueled the intrigue surrounding his unprecedented luck. In total, he walked away with a jaw-dropping two and a half million dollars from that visit alone. As the months passed, Joe Nadge's incredible winning streak continued, and he amassed a staggering $30 million in lottery winnings. The Michigan Lottery Commission was baffled. Speculation arose that Joe Nadge had discovered a way to manipulate the lottery system or had developed an infallible formula for predicting winning combinations. But Joe Nadge was doing something else entirely. Victor Joe Nadge's parents immigrated to the United States from Montenegro. Growing up in Sterling Heights, Michigan, young Victor shouldered significant responsibilities early on as his parents spoke limited English. At just 12 years old, he actually handled the sale of their family home. As a teenager, Joe Nadge had already displayed a remarkable mind for business and negotiation, and his persuasive demeanor earned him a reputation as a savvy operator. One particular deal involved haggling so fiercely for a used car that the owner actually offered him a job at his real estate firm, recognizing Joe Nadge's potential. Determined to lift his family out of poverty, Joe Nadge fully embraced the world of real estate, diving into the industry as a full-time agent right after his 18th birthday. His relentless drive eventually paid off and Joe Nadge's career soared, establishing him as one of the most prominent commercial real estate brokers in Detroit. He successfully negotiated deals for major companies, including a massive one for Walmart and several other well-known fast food chains. Joe Nadge was well on his way to attaining the wealth he desired. However, Joe Nadge's pursuit of wealth went beyond conventional means. He wasn't afraid to take risks and push boundaries, often engaging in high stakes deals to maximize profits. The desire for more money was intense, so Joe Nadge would constantly get involved with real estate transactions to buy and sell properties for quick profits, something he called flipping paper. Joe Nadge's descent into the world of gambling began innocently enough with $1 Kino games at his favorite bar. Little did he know that this simple hobby would ignite a passion for algorithms and number patterns. Convinced that lottery draws weren't purely random, he started to play the daily three and daily four games. Joe Nadge became obsessed with finding a way to predict winning numbers and developed elaborate systems and intricate spreadsheets to analyze past draw results. His belief in the existence of patterns fueled an obsession of winning big. Joe Nadge's regular haunt for purchasing lottery tickets was Piccolo's Liquor in Delhi. His significant activity in the store resulted in a notable boost of daily four ticket sales, escalating from $51,745 in 2015 to a staggering $1.3 million in 2016. The store's owners reaped the benefits, receiving a commission on ticket sales and prize money. While Joe Nadge celebrated several massive wins, his losses were equally substantial. As his fantasy of outsmarting the lottery unraveled, he fell into the gambler's fallacy, believing that previous draws would influence future outcomes. In reality, each lottery draw is an independent event, so no system was ever going to help. Despite the magnitude of his winnings, the truth behind his system revealed that it was merely an attempt to defy chance and probability by overwhelming the odds with number volume. In his relentless pursuit of fortune, Victor Jonadge established the Imperium Group, a real estate company that he hoped would pave the way for immense wealth. Around this time, his gambling habits had escalated, and he was spending loads of money on lottery games, chasing the dream of winning big jackpots. Enter Gregory Vito, a longtime friend who had then just been experiencing tough times. Having lost his job and struggling to support his daughter's college tuition, Vito found himself at a crossroads. Joe Nadge, known for his generosity and willingness to lend a helping hand, extended an offer to Vito to join the newly formed Imperium Group. Drawn in by the prospect of stable work, Vito quickly accepted the offer. 
Despite having no prior experience in real estate, Joe Nadge's persuasive charm and the allure of the business endeared him to Vito, who saw an opportunity for a fresh start. However, as their collaboration deepened, Vito became privy to Joe Nadge's elaborate spreadsheets and systems, all aimed at predicting winning lottery numbers. Despite Joe Nadge's conviction, Vito knew there was no real system in place. Since lottery draws are random, that didn't stop him from getting involved. In response to Joe Nadge's impressive winnings, lottery officials attempted to adjust the rules to compensate for his success by limiting each machine to $5,000 each day. However, Joe Nedge found a way to navigate these changes and continued gambling. With a deep belief in his system, Joe Nedge, accompanied by Vito, strategized and purchased mountains of lottery tickets, spending substantial amounts in the process. Their moves paid off, and Joe Nedge managed to win approximately $9.5 million. Vito's role in organizing and executing the plan had become integral and showcased the depth of their partnership and friendship. When they arrived at the claim center with thousands of winning tickets, Joe Nadge and Vito must have been a sight to behold. They requested the forms to claim winnings in triplicate and even rented a suite at a local hotel to have people fill out the paperwork around the clock. Despite his lottery success, Joe Nadge continued to attempt to run his real estate business, juggling his gambling pursuits with the demands of his professional life. Victor even had a commercial done for the Imperium Group where he broke through a wall and then posed on the roof of a building. As Joe Nadge's winnings continued to grow, he found it necessary to navigate navigate around potential obstacles that could arise from his massive wins. He devised a system of bribing and offering kickbacks to ensure smooth claims and avoid unwanted attention. One of the techniques he used was offering cash-filled coffee cups to the staff at lottery claim centers to encourage them to expedite the processing of his winning tickets. Despite the risks he was taking, Joe Nedge displayed an extraordinary sense of generosity. After a big win at Piccolo's, he told the owner's son to hand $10,000 in cash to a customer with a disabled child, showing his willingness to share his good fortune with others. His newfound wealth also led him to become a significant donor to causes such as kids kicking cancer. As the lottery operation expanded, managing the vast number of winning tickets became increasingly demanding, and Vito sought assistance from his daughter, Angelina. The then 17-year-old high school senior was eager to fill out the claim forms, memorizing Joe Nadge's personal details to streamline the process. Joe Nadge's operation appeared to be running smoothly, and the steady stream of wins fostered a sense of success. But as Joe Nadge as lottery wins began to fluctuate, the once promising stream of mass and victories became less reliable. The allure of his elaborate system gradually faded, revealing the truth that his approach was nothing more than buying an excessive number of lottery tickets. While this strategy had resulted in some significant wins, it came at an immense cost, and Joe Nadge's expenses were starting to add up. Joe Nadge eventually started to become a bit paranoid, suspecting that lottery officials were monitoring his activities because of the amount of money he'd won in such a short period. The pressure was mounting, but he remained committed to his strategy, spending hours every day obsessing over patterns and numbers in search of a winning formula. The lottery had become an all-consuming aspect of Joe Nadge and Vito's lives. The thrill of winning and the fear of losing engulfed them as they dealt with immense sums of money on a daily basis. Their operations grew increasingly complex, and the weight of their secret world began to strain their partnership. As their financial situation slowly deteriorated, suspicions arose between the partners. Vito, who had been fiercely loyal throughout their endeavors, began to question the legitimacy of the operation. He suspected that Joe Nedge might be offering kickbacks to the store owners without his knowledge. Despite the doubts creeping into their relationship, Vito remained dedicated to the cause. Joe Nedge's lottery victories began to wane even more, so he lured investors into lucrative real estate deals that were too good to be true. He promised massive returns and created an image of a hotshot broker who could generate immense profits. But the reality was far from the truth. Joe Nedge was basically running a Ponzi. He sold multiple investors purchasing rights to the same properties, creating an elaborate network of companies designed to defraud them and hide the money. He instructed buyers to wire large sums of money to a fake title company under his control, claiming it was for the purchase of properties. But instead of investing in real estate, Joe Nedge used the money to support his gambling habits and personal expenses. Among those deceived was Jerome Jerry Masakowski, who was tricked into purchasing a medical plaza. Joe Nedge manipulated Masakowski into making payments for the property, under false pretenses to delay the property's transfer into an LLC that Masakowski had created. The truth was that Joe Nedge had sold the same properties to multiple unsuspecting buyers. The scale of his deception and the massive amount of debt he accumulated were surprising. Joe Nedge had borrowed $1.5 million against the medical plaza he was developing without telling Masakowski. The once lucrative
lucrative lottery winnings had dried up completely, but he continued to buy large numbers of lottery tickets anyway to try and secure another big win. As Joe Nadge's troubles grew and his wins diminished, he found himself in a desperate situation. To maintain the illusion of success and hide the extent of his fraud, Joe Nadge began hiding his scams from Vito. Their once close partnership started to unravel, and Joe Nadge eventually forced Vito to leave the Imperium Group office. In his desperation to salvage his financial empire, Joe Nadge resorted to borrowing even more money and gambling excessively. He became obsessed with what he believed was the algorithm or the matrix, spending hours analyzing numbers and searching for patterns that would lead to more wins. However, the truth was that his system was nothing more than buying an exorbitant number of lottery tickets in the hopes of winning. All the failures caused Joe Nadge's behavior to become increasingly erratic, and he became convinced that the lottery commission was conspiring against him. He suspected that they had installed new machines in the stores he frequented, which he believed were designed to reduce the number of tickets being issued to him. Despite these suspicions, he refused to slow down, pouring more and more money into the lottery in an attempt to recapture his previous wins. At this point, it became clear that Joe Nadge had a severe gambling problem. As Joe Nadge's financial empire began to crumble, the stress started taking a toll on his health. He was struggling to manage the burden of owing millions of dollars to various investors and lenders. The weight of his misdeeds and the fear of his life being in danger because of his scams became too much to bear. The debts he owed to various stores started adding up, and with Joe Nadge failing to meet his obligations, Vito found himself on the hook for a substantial sum to the tune of $175,000. Determined to protect his own reputation and honor his promises, Vito resorted to desperate measures to pay back those he owed. He emptied his own safe and doled out cash to settle some of Joe Nadge's debts, even parting with cherished possessions like his Corvette, a Rolex, and jet skis. Vito's loyalty to his friend led him to make personal sacrifices to make amends. In a desperate attempt to salvage the situation, Joe Nadge also sought a loan from an investor named Dead Dead Vukic for $2.475 million, which he thought was for an investment opportunity. But Joe Nadge wanted the money to settle some debts, but was in such a hole that by this point, even a loan of this size didn't dent his financial problem. As the weight of the consequences his actions may have brought upon his family, since people tend to miss millions of dollars and tend to want it back and will go to any length to get it, Joe Nadge packed his belongings and turned himself into the FBI field office in downtown Detroit, hoping for protection. But despite his claims, the authorities found no evidence of any crimes and denied his request for protection. As Joe Nadge's empire collapsed, he found himself trapped in a web of legal troubles and crushing debts. The pressure became too much for him to bear, and in a desperate state of mind, Joe Nadge attempted to take his own life. The fallout from his real estate deals had also led to a lawsuit filed by Dedkovich for the $2.4 million, accompanied by eight other lawsuits for tens of millions. Eventually, Joe Nadge did manage to turn himself in and confess to federal prosecutors and FBI agents, sharing the full details and extent of his scheme. The legal proceedings led to Joe Nadge being charged with one count federal wire fraud. In the midst of the turmoil, Vito too was deeply concerned for his own safety and that of his family. He had been unknowingly entangled in Joe Nadge's schemes and worried about the consequences consequences of his involvement. Vito eventually testified against Joe Nadge in a civil case, revealing the truth that the Imperium Group was nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. Despite his involvement, Vito emerged relatively unscathed from the legal proceedings. His cooperation with authorities seemed to protect him from more significant repercussions. The only winners were the owners of the stores where Joe Nadge and Vito had bought the lottery tickets. The owners of Piccolo's raked in $2.38 million in commissions from the sales. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here on this video video for our past release to find out about some of the almost perfect scams, such as this guy stealing over $3.3 billion worth of Bitcoin. Joe Nadge eventually pleaded guilty to the one count of federal wire fraud he was charged with. As part of his plea deal, Joe Nadge agreed to make restitution for an insane $25 million, as well as forfeit $19 million, although it seemed unlikely that his victims would ever fully recover their losses. The sentencing hearing showed that Joe Nadge's greed didn't even spare his own family. His wife wife Rose showed her support in court, but then she found out that Joe Nadge had taken advantage of her family as well, allegedly taking her father for another $2.4 million. Joe Nadge was ultimately sentenced to 53 months in prison. The self-surrendered at FCI Morgantown, a federal prison facility often referred to as Club Fed, due to its relatively comfortable accommodation. During the court proceedings, it became clear that Joe Nadge had developed a severe disorder in misusing different types of substances. The court ordered him to participate in an addiction program after his release. Joe Nadge claimed that he had learned his lesson and was done with gambling for good. But Joe Nadge also admitted to keeping his lottery charts and spreadsheets. Everyone wants to be rich, famous, and loved, often in that order. We 
We all have the dream of our numbers finally coming in and winning it big, being handed heaps of unearned cash via a comically large check. But the quest for unearned wealth often leaves those that overly pursue it broken and compromised. Victor Jonad started out as the story of a promising young man who had a bright future and massive potential, but the drive for endlessly wanting more only wasted that potential and destroyed the lives of those around him. His gambling problem was a shortcut to wealth he could have possibly had if he just devoted the same amount of time to his legitimate business. Ultimately, Victor's story teaches us that often taking shortcuts almost always costs us more than we expect and that there are repercussions that come along with those shortcuts. The relentless pursuit of anything may end up costing everything. These scams were ingenious, and if it wasn't for one thing or another, we wouldn't be talking about them right now, because they would have gotten away. Let's get started with... Number 4. You can account on her. Allison Smith stole more than a million euros from the small family business where she worked. She carried out her clever fraud for nine years, and was only caught after she had left the company. After a review, accountants discovered a payment Allison had recorded hadn't actually gone through and the supplier hadn't yet been paid. Allison had been stealing money by duplicating invoices and changing the bank details of suppliers and paying herself instead. So what did sneaky Allison get with her loot? Well, she used the bulk of the cash to fund expensive vacations, buy expensive cars for her children, and renovate her daughter's home. She also used a part of the money to fund a growing gambling addiction, because as everyone knows, it's always better to gamble with someone else's money. Since she was such a trusted longtime employee, Allison was able to have the time of her life living on stolen funds without anyone raising an eyebrow. Aside from her creative accounting, Allison had other ways to avoid detection. One method was setting members of the family against one another. If they were fighting with each other, they wouldn't have time to look at her. The daughter of the company's owner, known as Ms. Lane, said Allison went to great lengths to ensure that she and her husband weren't involved in the business. Allison did that so that she could have unfettered access to the company's finances and continue defrauding it as she liked. Ms. Lane further said that she'd had a fantastic relationship with her family, but Allison had gone to great lengths to sow animosity. Allison's lawyer argued that she had developed a gambling addiction many years ago, and her actions were a result of that addiction. The lawyer also claimed that Allison had used alcohol to try and cope with her fraud. In the end, Allison pled guilty to the crime of fraud and was sentenced to five years in prison. However, only five of those were to be spent in custody. In his closing remarks, the judge said that Allison appeared to feel sorry for herself and for the family she stole for. That regret, said the judge, was taken into account before a sentence was passed. It's nice to know she was held accountable. Number three, booby trapped. Dr. Ian Patterson is a breast cancer surgeon who was accused of carrying out damaging and unnecessary surgeries for over 15 years. Since the beginning of his career as a doctor, serious questions about Patterson's competency had been raised. In 1996, he performed what should have been a low-risk operation, but the patient almost didn't make it. Yet, he was still allowed to continue unquestioned, operating on hundreds of patients. Everywhere Patterson was employed, he brought with him a reputation for being difficult and stubborn. It was always his way or the highway, and his former employers often warned his new employers of his behavior. But the warnings went unheeded. Patterson eventually found himself at a hospital with a serious surgery waiting list problem. But this didn't phase our butcher doctor, as he often completed his surgeries in record time, which is something you always want to hear when getting surgery. Procedures that were supposed to take two hours took just 25 minutes, and in a year, he had dealt with over 350 cancer patients. He was like the Flash if the Flash had a medical degree and was into carelessly performing surgeries. Concerns about Patterson's methods eventually arose. One complaint that repeatedly came up was the amount of tissue Patterson left behind after performing a mastectomy. He once told a patient's husband that he did this intentionally as he wanted his patients to still have a bit of cleavage. 
how kind of him. In time, this quackery bore fruit and his patients began to report higher than normal cancer recurrence rates. The reason was simple. Patterson had simply done an awful job with his mastectomies. Those recurrences soon led to astonishing patient recall rates. It got so bad that the hospital had to recall as many of his mastectomy patients as they could. But even that wasn't enough to stop Patterson from practicing. At the end of 2011, almost 400 of his mastectomy patients didn't make it. By the middle of 2017, which was two years after his arrest, the number was closer to 700. As the scale of Patterson's negligence and incompetence became apparent, lawsuits against the hospitals he worked for increased. At one point, the hospital he worked at settled over 800 claims and paid out almost around 18 million pounds. It wasn't left to be a civil matter either. The police soon launched an investigation into Patterson's private practice. Charges were brought against him, and he eventually had his day in court. In court, Patterson's victims had a lot to say about his behavior. Dr. Rosemary Platt told the court that Patterson had performed an unnecessary operation to remove her left breast. Others in court spoke about how he exaggerated the risks they faced to get them to acquiesce to surgery. According to a colleague, Patterson was falsely diagnosing patients with cancer on a larger scale. He didn't even perform a biopsy on many patients and would simply operate on them after the first consultation. Even in court, Patterson's behavior was less than ideal. He constantly antagonized his patients and even called one of them a slur. He also mouthed the words, you're a liar, to another while she made her statement. One might wonder why Patterson's bosses at the hospital he worked at didn't notice his disturbing behavior. The truth is that the managerial class of the hospital was usually more concerned with target goals than with the performance of their doctors. Patterson, on the other hand, wasn't performing all these surgeries just because he was an awful person. He was also performing them because they made him more money. He spent the money he made from the surgeries on expensive properties around the world and expensive suits. He dined in Michelin-starred restaurants, drove an Aston Martin, and was treated like a celebrity at sporting events. He also bought a 1.25 million pound eight-bedroom Georgian mansion in Bastion and a vacation home in Florida with views over a private golf course. The decision of the court was straightforward. Patterson was convicted for over 17 counts of intentional injury and was jailed for 20 years. In the end, the evidence that convicted Patterson came from a whistleblower who'd been his colleague for over 10 years. The name of this colleague was Hemant Ingle. Dr. Ingle had been worried about Patterson's performance of unnecessary procedures and wrote letters outlining his quackery. He also raised concerns about questionable procedures in Patterson's presence. However, Patterson promised to get Ingle sacked if he continued to ask questions. Dr. Ingle's first batch of whistleblowing letters prompted an internal investigation that proved that Patterson was carrying out unnecessary procedures. However, the result of that investigation inspired no action from the hospital's management. Patterson also had a deal with the NHS where he took on excess patients and treated them privately. Dr. Ingle himself only knew the extent of the harm Patterson had caused when a few of the butchered doctor's patients were referred to him after his arrest. That's when Dr. Ingle made a comprehensive review of cases and discovered that Patterson was the patron saint of medical malpractice. The cases were so numerous that in the end, a compensation fund backed by the NHS Inspire paid out 37 million pounds to around 750 patients. Number two, cupcake capers. Ava Virginia Misseldine started her life as a chemical engineering student at Ohio State University. After graduating, she made a living as a cancer researcher, but after years of toiling in the lab, she decided that she needed a break. Misseldine had always enjoyed baking with her grandmother, so she ventured into baking instead. She found almost immediate success in her new career and became one of the most respected bakers in Ohio. Very soon, her work was so renowned that she was once featured on Food Network's The Best Thing I Ever Ate it would seem like her life was on the up and up. However, there was just one tiny hiccup. Misseldine was never a cancer researcher, and her grandmother had never taught her how to bake. Most of what was in the public domain about her life was false. She wasn't just baking cakes in her bakeries. She was also cooking up lies. Misseldine's identity scam started after she was released from prison in 2000, following a 1997 conviction for theft and forgery. That's when she decided to steal the identity of someone else and use their documents to create a new life for herself. Misseldine started her fraud by getting an official Ohio State ID card in the name of her victim, Brie Bourgeois. Meanwhile, the real Brie Bourgeois had passed away back in 1979, not long after being born. 
However, Miss Aldine didn't care. She took the ID card she'd acquired and then used it to get a social security card and a driver's license. To authenticate her claim that she was indeed Brie Bourgeoise, Miss Aldine also presented a copy of the original birth certificate and the names of her real parents, Jacques and Paula Bourgeoise. After getting the documents that supported her lie, Miss Aldine continued to live under her real name and that of Brie Bourgeoise. In 2006, she obtained a driver's license under her real name in addition to the license she already had under Brie's name. The next year, Miss Aldine used her identity as Brie Bourgeoise to get a job as a flight attendant for Columbus-based private charter service Jet Select. Miss Aldine also got a student pilot certificate using the Brie Bourgeoise name. In addition to that, she got a passport for Brie Bourgeoise using her fake driver's license and a letter from the company she worked at. Despite walking such thin lies, Miss Aldine didn't even stay out of crime. In 2007, she went to court as Brie Bourgeoise for theft charges where she pleaded guilty. In the court papers, her home address was the same one she used for her legal Misseldeen driver's license. Then in 2014, at a bankruptcy hearing, Misseldeen's mask almost slipped. This bankruptcy was done under her real name Misseldeen, and in court, she was asked if she'd ever used the name Brie Bourgeoise for anything. She replied that she'd only used the name for about two years, and had used it four years ago. She also claimed that she was adopted and that Brie Bourgeoise was her birth name. She argued that she only used Brie Bourgeoise for a while until her adoptive family became upset about it. She wasn't adopted, and Brie Bourgeoise was, was the name of a real infant that passed away at 18 weeks old. It almost seemed like Missile Dean would never be caught and that she would get away with everything. But then the pandemic happened. As the pandemic progressed and loans became available for business owners, Missile Dean saw one more opportunity to scam the government. She applied for Paycheck Protection Program funds using both her real name and her fake name. Since she had updated documents for both names, she was able to apply for the two identities at once. Missile Dean listed various businesses including ones that had closed down as establishments that required paycheck protection funds. In the end, she received up to one and a half million dollars in government loans that were eventually forgiven. Miss Aldean, as one could expect, didn't use these monies to pay employees. She used them to purchase real estate. She purchased a $650,000 home adjacent to Zion National Park in Utah and also acquired a $330,000 spread in Michigan. Miss Aldean thought she would never get caught. She was very wrong. Miss Aldean's fraud unraveled totally in 2021 when she tried to apply for a new passport as Brie Bourgeoise. She made the mistake of listing Miss Aldean's email address instead of a separate Brie Bourgeoise one on her application. Internal systems flagged the application and investigators soon found her out. She was arrested and charged with passport fraud, social security number fraud, aggravated identity theft, and fraud in connection with major disaster or emergency benefits. She faces up to 30 years in prison if convicted. Number one, James Zhang, Bitcoin King. The U.S. Department of Justice seized around $3 billion in stolen Bitcoin from the residence of James Zong. Zong stole the Bitcoin from Silk Road, an illegal dark web marketplace for every kind of contraband. Silk Road was first opened in 2011 and closed down in 2013. To steal the Bitcoins, Zong created nine fraudulent accounts on Silk Road and funded each with anything from 200 to 2,000 Bitcoins. He then triggered over 140 transactions in rapid succession on the market, which then and trick the market's online systems to release up to 50,000 Bitcoins to Zong's accounts. As soon as he got the Bitcoins, Zong transferred them all to accounts under his control. Zing had his crypto like a 12-year-old kid hiding his dirty magazines. Police found a computer submerged under blankets in a popcorn tin in a bathroom closet holding $3 billion. Aside from the Bitcoin, the police also found $661,900 in cash, 25 Casasius coins, which are physical Bitcoins, four one ounce silver colored bars, three one ounce gold colored bars, four 10 ounce silver colored bars, and one gold colored coin. His house was Treasure Island. So, did Zong go to a bunch of expensive restaurants like all the other scammers in the club? Nope. Zong actually sat on billions of dollars for nine years and never used them to buy anything. In fact, in the end, Zong was the one who reported himself to authorities. In 2019, he called the local police to report a burglary and reported that a lot of his bitcoins had been stolen. The police investigated the original crime that Zong reported and never recovered any cash or bitcoin. They didn't even have a suspect. However, the IRS Criminal Investigation Unit had an an even bigger suspect on their hands, Mr. Zong himself. After investigations, they got a search warrant and raided Zong's home two years after he reported it was burgled. Once authorities got into his home and started searching, they hit gold almost instantly. 
In the end, our crypto prince of crime had no choice but to give away his treasure to the government. He was promptly charged to court, and he pled guilty to one count of wire fraud. He didn't just plead guilty, he also helped the French recover crypto that they hadn't found in his house. Right now, he's helped them recover over a thousand bitcoins. At this point, like the Fed's human bitcoin finder, he's scheduled to be sentenced next year and could see up to 20 years of prison time. That should teach him not to rip off an illegal website that was frequented by criminals and then not ever touch the money he stole and cooperate with authorities. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section, what's your biggest win ever in the lottery or gambling in general.